You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner. Always a treat to have Professor, I like to call him Avi Dershowitz. Everybody knows him as Alan Dershowitz, the lawyer of last resort. And he knows what's going on legally and very much involved in the Jewish community. So thank you for joining us again. Well, it's a sad day today. The death of Shelley Silver uh, was avoidable and uh, it shouldn't have happened, certainly not under the circumstances in which it did happen. I tried very hard to get President Trump to um, commute the sentence of Shelley and he came very close to doing it. And then people put pressure on him not to. And in the end, um, he was persuaded not to do it, but he should have done it. And then Shelley should have been allowed to die at home. He should have been allowed to get hospitalization. He's had a kidney condition for a long time. This was an avoidable death. And uh, this was something that was based on selective injustice, not on uh, one standard for all. Now, I understand that the that they were going to allow him, that the family of Shelley said was notified that Donald Trump, the president, was going to uh, reduce his sentence. And then some Republicans objected, and he was afraid of losing his Republican senators, so therefore he reneged on it. Well, I don't know if I put it exactly that way. Um, I didn't know that he had definitely decided to do it. I had, the, family, the family was notified. I spoke to somebody close to the family today. The family was notified. I worked very hard to try to persuade him. And I thought he was persuaded. And then I was told, not by him, but by people in the White House, that he had been persuaded uh, against doing it. I don't know why. I have no idea whether or not it was Republican senators or anybody else, but it was the wrong decision. Uh, Look, Shelley was a really good person. He did a tremendous amount of good for New York, for the Jewish community of New York. Uh, Was he flawed? Uh, Look, the greatness of the Jewish Bible is that Avraham was flawed, Moshe was flawed, David was certainly flawed. Uh, We have a book full of flawed great leaders as distinguished from the Christian Bible and the the Muslim Quran, which have unflawed leaders. We recognize that humans have flaws and uh, Shelley had flaws, and uh, but the flaws didn't warrant the treatment that he got and uh, he was not treated fairly at the end of his life. Now, we're talking about the the commutation, Donald, the President Trump didn't happen. But here's what's, first of all, from what I was told, the last three weeks his health deteriorated and prosecutors refused to allow him to go from a prison hospital, which you know the conditions are not great, to a regular hospital. Maybe they could have kept him alive and so they wouldn't let him go because they're afraid that he would he wouldn't be in the prison system anymore. But how much discretion do prosecutors have when somebody's on his deathbed in a situation like this? And how much should they be let somebody like that go to a hospital? Well, they have fear rates. And the system is cruel. And, you know, prosecutors like to chalk up victories. And when they have a victory, they don't like to show weakness. Um, that's why I never became a prosecutor. I could never be a prosecutor. If I were a prosecutor and somebody asked me to be sent to a regular hospital, of course the answer would be yes, to be able to go home. He went home for a short period of time uh, during COVID, but then he was sent back. He should never have been sent back. I have other clients who uh, were sent back and they remained out and they became good law-abiding citizens. There's much, much discretion in prosecutors, much, too much discretion in in judges, and the discretion is not uh, always exercised wisely or with, or with compassion. You know, the Torah says, tzedek, tzedek, tirdov. One tzedek may be justice, the other tzedek is rachmanut, rachmanus, justice with compassion and pity. And judges and prosecutors ought to understand the second meaning of justice as well as the first meaning. Now, you mentioned something which I was going to get to, that they did allow him out of prison due to COVID, but there was an outcry and they put him back. So the question though, that I have is twofold. Number one, why do they put him back if you let him out? And can justice be, can they show favoritism? They, some people like Dean Skelos, you allow out, and Michael Cohen, you allow out. Um, Michael, no, I'm sorry? Michael Avenatti 
was allowed. Michael out. Abinati, okay. So no, can justice be selective and say, you, I like, I'm going to let out, and you, I dislike, or people put pressure on us back to prison? Should yeah, there be a level playing field? It's, it's a word. It's called injustice. It's called inequality. It's called violation of the 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. Uh, it's not fair. And uh, our system is simply unjust when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, it's Einstein once famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Uh, but prosecutors and judges do play dice. Uh, often they play loaded dice um, with the lives of individuals because they succumb to erroneous political pressures. Um, you know, when you're in politics, People are going to like you and dislike you. Uh, and when you're controversial, as I am, people like you or don't like you. And those factors should not come into play in deciding how to do justice. So I think this is a, a case study in injustice and unfairness. My question, though, is, though, legally, can they do that? And should could they have been stopped? Should the Silver family have mounted a legal challenge to being put back into prison when everybody else with similar medical conditions and similar what they mm -hmm. view as crimes were let out and can they say you i like and you could be people complain so we're putting you back can you do that legally if you can if you you're not allowed to do it then i was wondering if there was any legal recourse they would have had well you're not allowed to do it but courts allow them to do it courts are human beings that are part of the system and uh their judges are afraid uh, they're afraid of being criticized. They're afraid of not being promoted. Um, and this was a case of horrible, horrible uh, miscarriage of, of, of justice. I'm not talking about the conviction. I don't know enough about that. All I know is that the treatment that he got in prison was based on political considerations largely and based on favoritism and lack of favoritism and a fear that because he's a prominent person, if he was let out, it would become known. Sometimes it's better not to be well known. Sometimes it's better to be poor and obscure. Sometimes you get better justice that way. Sometimes you don't. But the system is not a good system. If you ask me to rank the American system of justice today against the European system, the Canadian system, the Israeli system, the Australian system, the New Zealand system, comparable Western democracies, the United States is at the bottom of that list, tragically. It ought to be at the top. We have the best constitution, um, but we have um, a lot of injustice, a lot of injustice. And too much of it is based on the media, on what the media will say. And the media didn't want Shelley Siegel to be released. The media didn't, Shelley Silver, the media didn't want him to be sent to hospitals. And every judge and every prosecutor knew that there'd be pushback if they did the right thing. And so I think many of them knowingly did the wrong thing to protect their own reputations. No, it certainly is a sad story that this transpired the way that transpired. And I guess there's no legal request from what you're saying. The judges have discretion in these kinds of cases, what you're really saying, even though the law really should be colorblind and treat everybody equally. That's exactly right. You know, in Shoftim, uh, there are two admonitions to judges. The second one, the second one is you shouldn't take bribes. What's the first one? Lo takir panim. Do not recognize faces. That's even more important than don't take bribes. We have to have a system that is unbiased, that is not identity politics, that is not based on who you are or what party you're from or what religion you are. Um, it has to be lo takir panim. That's why the statue of justice has a blindfold. It comes from the Torah. The blindfold comes from the Torah. People always emphasize the part of Shoftim says Sedek Sedek Tir Dof. Lo Takir Anim is even more important. Do not recognize faces. No, we certainly have a problem. Now, some people have said to me, and I want to get your opinion, that maybe there's some element of anti-Semitism involved. Do you think that there is some element of that? I think there is always a concern that you have to lean over backwards when it comes to Jews not to give them any kind of favorable justice because otherwise it will be perceived as favorable. You can call that anti-Semitism, you can call that insensitivity, um, but you can also call it that the system is not 
super blind. It's not religion blind. And it's certainly not blind to the faces of who's before them. No, and that's another issue. So what can we do to redress these kinds of issues, Professor Alan Dershowitz? Because, first of all, America incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. No, no, and- not more than any other country. Iran, China. And- we're oh, from, the, from the rest of the democratic yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. So what what can be done? Because I know there's talk about criminal reform. Even President Donald Trump started doing some uh, prison yeah. reform. What can be do? Because it just seems things are getting where. In fact, I, you, you probably know better than I do. I spoke to criminal defense lawyers that say even 90 percent of cases are settled by plea bargain because people don't have the resources. They want to go against the government, go on a court, even though they're they might be innocent. It's not a matter of the resources. If you don't plead guilty and you get convicted, you'll get five times, 10 times the amount of sentence. I did help persuade President Trump, to his credit, to give commutations to a number of people who got what I call the trial penalty. In one case, there were two people that I want to get into names. They were offered seven and five years if they pleaded guilty. They didn't plead guilty. They went to trial and they got 75 years. When I told wow. President Trump's story, he immediately uh, issued commutations, but it has to be better than commutations. Today, it's very hard to plead not guilty because the punishment for invoking your constitutional rights is five times or 10 times a multiple of the criminal sentencing. So the system is completely skewed against going to trial and completely skewed in favor of plea bargaining. We're speaking to Harvard Law Professor Emeritus Professor Alan Avi Dershowitz, lawyer of last resort. We're looking at the case, the sad story of Shelley Silver, who died in a prison hospital that would not transfer him. Remember Shelley's good things. He did so much good for the community. He did so much good for New York. He should not be remembered only for his criminal conviction and the manner in which he was allowed to die. He should also be remembered for the very, very good things um, and the, the, the great, great uh, work he did on behalf of the Jewish community, his community in New York, um, and, and the American people. Uh, he was a very, very good man, and he should be remembered for that. Absolutely. But the problem is, is that once you're an elected official and they put you in prison, I think, especially all your other friends, whether they were in the assembly or in politics, they all abandon you. Even though I have to do say that uh, former Assemblyman Harvey Weisenberg, who we had him on the air last week, pleading for clemency that he should be let out for medical reasons. But you don't see a lot of other elected officials. They all run away. Right. Uh, unfortunately, that's part of what we see. Look, I have to tell you, um, that's true of uh, people in general. I'm so disappointed with the way the Jewish community so often abandons its people um, when they're under attack. Um, It's so interesting. When I saw the 60 Minute program on uh, Anne Frank and how she may or very well have been turned in by a Jewish collaborator, it did not suck me, having dealt with Jewish leaders around the United States and around the world, not all, there are many great exceptions to this, but there are too many who are just concerned with their own self, with their own security, with their own financial security. Um, it's a great, it's been a great, great disappointment to me. And the, the Shelley Silver case is, is an example of that. Did you find that Jewish leaders came to your defense because your name was muddied in the newspaper regarding the Epstein affair? Did you find that Jewish leaders and the Jewish community came to rally behind you? Mostly in the Orthodox community, the Hasidic community, the uh, Chabad community all came to rally behind me. And people who knew me came to rally behind me. But uh, the rabbi in Temple Emanuel threw me under the bus. The head of the 92nd Street Y threw me under the bus. The Ramah school threw me under the bus. They all knew. Orthodox, yeah, huh? All knew uh, that I never met the woman, that she made up the whole story, that she made up the story about Ehud Barak. She made up the story about George Mitchell. She made up the story about Bill Richardson. She made up the story about Leslie Wexner. She made up the story about me. In my case, I never even met her. I never heard of her. But the Jewish leaders were saying, ah, sh- schmutzy, ah, we don't want to get involved. Yeah, you've done a lot of good for the Jewish community over the years. That was yesterday. 
Uh, not today. So shame on Temple Emanuel. Shame on the 92nd Street Y. Shame on the Ramaz uh, School. The Ramaz School is the most troubling one of all because I offered free of charge to help educate their students who were going off to college on how to combat anti-Semitism at colleges and how to combat anti-Zionism at colleges. And they asked me to do it. I didn't volunteer. They asked me to do it. And I said, yes. And then the headmaster said, no, we can't have you. Excuses. Oh, we don't have time. There's COVID and all that. Total nonsense. Some people, mach is on the board. That's what it was at Temple Emanuel as well. Uh, a man named Diamond, who head of an advertising firm that advertised extremely dangerous products. Uh, no great mensch himself. But um, Diamond decided, no, I could never speak from the Temple Emanuel because uh, Epstein would rub off on the great holy uh, Temple Emanuel. So um, um, I was canceled as well there. But I'm not talking about me. I can defend myself. I'm well, I'm, uh, you know, uh, a uh, able to defend myself. I worry about people like Shelley Silver, who as soon as they get into any trouble are abandoned uh, by large elements of the Jewish community. I have to tell you, though, the Orthodox community, uh, in general, in general, you can't make extreme generalizations, but in general, is much more, and not only of me, but of uh, Shelley and of many, many other people. Um, there's a sense of loyalty in the Orthodox community that I think uh, extends far less to the reform, uh, conservative, and secular communities. Because they operate under a principle called Hakkari Satov, recognition of good that yeah. was done. And against yeah. and Hurrah. Again, again, <clears throat> it's so easy to engage in, in Lush and Hurrah and just to spread it. And, um, you know, it's one of the great, one of the great of Erot is, is Lush and Hurrah. And it's practiced so often <clears throat> by leaders of every community. But I'm most disappointed when it's practiced by leaders of the Jewish community. Now, by the way, last time we had you on our program, we're dealing with Ramaz and 92nd Street Y and Temple of Mount. We got a lot of reaction to that. So it did resonate. So I know the issue hasn't been resolved, but it's important to speak out. But again, it's not about me. I have plenty of places to speak. I have plenty of students. Uh, other Jewish high schools have obviously asked me to help educate their students, and I'm, I'm going to do it. It's not about me. It's about the Jewish leadership, about the Jewish community. And, um, you know, about basic justice. And uh, we have to see more of that and less selfishness. Now, I know you're close to former Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. And we spoke right. before about plea bargains. So there is a plea bargain on the table in Israel that they asked Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu to take, that they won't prosecute him. He has to stay out of politics or running for office for seven years. I believe he's turning it down. Do you think he may, he's making a wise decision by not taking it, or, or do you take your plea bargain, which we find in this country, 90% of the people who are have have problems with the prosecution end up taking it? Look, uh, Bibi Netanyahu is a courageous man. Just remember who his father was, remember who his brother was, <clears throat> remember who he is. He is not a guy who's going to take the easy uh, way out. Uh, he is uh, being, I think, unfairly prosecuted. Um, my hope is that he fights, that he's vindicated. Remember, too, that in Israel there's no jury. So it's a bunch of judges. And um, the judges come from an elite group in society that generally is not particularly favorable to Netanyahu or his party or his ideology. So he faces an uphill fight uh, in the Jerusalem uh, District Court. Uh, and um, I hope he makes that fight because I think he has a very, very uh, strong case. Um, I don't get into Israeli politics about who I would vote for, but, you know, I've been a friend of Bibi's since his mid-20s um, um, uh, when I was a young assistant professor and he was a student at uh, MIT Sloan School. We were on a show called The Advocates, and uh, we became friends there. Uh, um, I uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have never gone to Israel in the last, what, 20 years without having dinner um, with uh, BB. And when he's come to Cambridge, he's had dinner at our home. Uh, so, you know, we're close personal friends, closer than I am with other prime ministers and presidents. I consider myself a friend of all the Israeli prime ministers, particularly of the current president, who's a wonderful, wonderful man. 
uh, Bougie Herzog and uh, just lost his mother uh, tragically. But she was a wonderful woman. I sat next to her uh, not so long ago at an auction in Tel Aviv. I mean, uh, this is a family that's remarkable. You know, the grandfather was the chief rabbi of Ireland. The father was the president of Israel. The brother is now the uh, Israeli ambassador uh, to the United uh, States. Uh, what an amazing family. And I'm so thrilled that Bougie is the, the president of Israel. I can't call him by that name anymore. I have to call him Mr. President. But uh, it's a thrill for me to, to know that um, uh, the president of Israel is such a mensch. I'm going to digress for a moment. I don't know if you're aware of something in the possession of the Herzog family, which his grandfather, Chief Rabbi Herzog, had. In Hitler's bunker, he kept a copy of the Shah, so the Talmud Tractate Pesachim, one of the few items that they found when they raided his bunker, and it ended up in the Chief Rabbi's possession in Israel. And I checked it with one of the members of the family that they still have the, oh, the memorial that's it. in Hitler's bunker. What was Hitler doing? He was not a member of the Dafyomi, I can tell no. you. And all he had was Sachem, but I'm going to speculate. He died around. He died on April 20th around the Passover holiday time. So he wanted to finish the Jews, and he wanted to finish Shas, and Shas, in a sense, finished him. So You know this joke when Hitler, Gemach Shemo, goes to a fortune teller and says, when am I going to die? And the fortune teller says, on a Jewish holiday. And he says, which one? And he says, any day you die will be a Jewish holiday. So... Um, we know he died on a Jewish holiday, and uh, and uh, the tragedy is that we see increasing anti-Semitism in Germany. Um, and I hope that the new uh, chancellor is as good as the old chancellor in fighting against anti-Semitism and strengthening the ties between Germany and uh, Israel. Before I let you go, you mentioned your close friends with the president of Israel, former prime minister of Israel. What's your relationship with the current president of the United States? And he had a relationship with Joe Biden and Bill Clinton. Um, actually, with, Bill, with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. What's your relationship with, with President Joe Biden? Well, I've known him for 42 years. We met uh, during uh, uh, Ted Kennedy's campaign for president. I was a very close friend of Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy is not as well known as he should be for his work on Soviet Jewry. Uh, I worked hand in hand with Ted Kennedy when he was in the Senate. And he introduced me to this young new senator from Delaware uh, named Joe Biden. And uh, the one thing that's clear is he was no different back then as, than he is today. I mean, he was the nicest guy, always sweet, always asking about family. I'll just tell you a story about him. Uh, I have it on tape. Uh, so I was in the White House for a Hanukkah party during the Obama administration. And I had my phone with me when I was meeting with the the vice president, you're not supposed to have your phone, whatever, my phone rang. And I said, oh, it's my grandson telling me whether he got into Harvard College or not. He said, take the call. So I took the call and my grandson got into Harvard College. And uh, then Vice President Biden grabbed the phone and asked me what his name was. And I said, Lyle, he said, hey, Lyle, good move. Great thing getting into Harvard. Now be smart and go to the University of Delaware. It's a better school. So, you know, that's that's Joe Biden. He's always nice. Um, and um, uh, I think he loves Israel. Uh, nobody can persuade me that, unlike uh, um, uh, Barack Obama, uh, that he is uh, that he has tentative feelings toward Israel. I think he is supportive of Israel. Let's remember, people forget about this. What was first five appointments to office? His chief of staff, Jewish guy. Uh, his secretary of state, Jewish guy. Secretary of treasury, Jewish. Uh, a woman, uh, Homeland Security, uh, a Jewish guy. And he didn't appoint them because they were Jewish. He appointed them because they were the most qualified people for the job. It's just that their being Jewish was not in any way a negative. He didn't say, how many Jews do I have in a uh, cabinet? Whoever was qualified, he put in the cabinet. So, you know, you can be critical of his policies. I'm uh, critical of some of them, obviously. But uh, Joe Biden's a good man. I hope he doesn't disappoint America and the Jewish community and Israel regarding Iran. Well, I hope he doesn't disappoint uh, them the way Barack Obama did. I made the mistake of voting for Barack Obama the second time. I think the first decision to vote for him was right. But I got conned into supporting him the second time. He called me into the Oval Office. He said, I have Israel's back. I didn't realize he meant to, to paint the target on it. Um, and he told me he would never do anything to jeopardize 
uh, Israel security in relation to Iran. He called me while I was in Israel and asked me at one point, uh, you're in Israel, you're speaking to the prime minister. What are the five things that are most important to Israel and to the prime minister? I said, let me give you to them in order the five things. Iran, Iran, Iran. <laughs> Iran. He said, all right, I got it. I got it. I got it. I get your point. I said, that's what's important. And that's what you have to do if you uh, want to do the right thing on behalf of Israel. And he didn't. He did the wrong thing. And I hope the Biden administration and Tony Blinken, who's a good man, too, uh, will do the right thing. Have you had any contact with Barack Obama since he left office? Um, I think I said hello to him once on Martha's Vineyard, but we're not on good terms at this point. Uh, he wrote me for my 75th birthday. He wrote me the loveliest note, um, you know, commending me. And he wrote me a lovely note on my retirement from Harvard. But um, I let him know what I thought on two things. One, the Iran deal, but even more seriously in terms of our personal friendship, was allowing that U.N. resolution to go through, which basically declared the Kotel to be illegally occupied territory, the Jewish quarter to be illegally occupied territory, the access roads to Hebrew University and Adassa Hospital, all to be illegally occupied territory. And for the president of the United States to sign on to a declaration like that, that was the stab in the back that terminated my relationship with, with Barack Obama. I could imagine. I could imagine. And I want to thank you, Professor Alan Alvey Dorsches, for joining with us. Professor, how's the Chabad doing in your house on Martha's Vineyard? Well, it's not in my house, but we're doing great. We had we had last uh, we have uh, Friday night, uh, Friday at four o'clock, Arab Shabbos. Uh, we have a get together virtually. We sing Shalom Aleichem. We do a Dvar Torah. Uh, we tell some stories, um, and we're having some speakers over the next uh, few months. And so we're starting our community virtually. Uh, and then hopefully it'll be as good as the one at Harvard. No, nothing will ever. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, anyway, thank you again for being with us. Continue success. And we always look forward, always an honor, always a treat to have uh, Alan Avi Dershowitz, uh, formerly a Harvard Press Emeritus. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Keep doing great things.